Hey, Flow and Go community, it's Janice. And as many of you know, I'm a respiratory therapist, which means I help people breathe, but I often help people breathe when they're not feeling their best. And joining me today is Amanda Kind. She is a singer, a songwriter, a voice teacher based here in Waterloo region. Uh, she's working in the arts and the music community and has garnered Waterloo Region's Arts Award, the Rogers Television uh, Women of the Year Award. The list goes on here. She's recognized- Oh, goodness. One of the region's, hold on, we're not done yet. One of the region's top 40 under 40. She's passionate about community, culture, and kindness and loves connecting with people. We'll tell you how you can find out more about her at the end, but I will say she- has an absolutely incredible voice. I One of my fondest memories of you is getting to hear you sing Shallow by <laughs> Cooper and Lady Gaga. And you just held everyone in the room, like the entire bar stopped talking. It was a privilege to listen to, and I still get chills thinking about it. So, Oh, goodness. You know what? I will say I do love singing that song. Who doesn't love singing Lady Gaga? Come on. I mean... I rock it in the car. That's my thing. You just Everybody should. Everybody should rock it in the car and in the shower. And in the shower. <laughs> There's a window in my shower, so I have to be careful because <laughs> I'm like, no, man, the neighbors don't need to hear that. Oh, my gosh. All right. Let's dive in here to focus specifically on breathing. So as a singer, take me through how important the breath is to you and what you do. Well, singing, you know, breath is the foundation of singing in many ways. You know, when we think about the singing process, there's kind of four, kind of four components that we think about. And breath is kind of the first one. So the generation of the sound. And then the breath goes into the body, into the lungs, goes up through the trachea and goes through the closed vocal folds. So a lot of people don't know that, but your vocal folds are closed when you create sound. That's called phonation. And so if the air coming up you know, is efficient and, and you're getting a nice closure. It feels really relaxed to be able to create big sounds. So again, breath goes into the lungs, up through the trachea, up through the closed vocal folds. And it's still kind of a buzzy sound at that point. And then it goes, those air kind of particles and molecules bounce off the spaces that are in your head and neck and create resonance. And then it goes out your mouth and your teeth and lips and tongue, those articulation pieces help you create that actual sound. And so the breath is the number one stop on that list. And so if, if the air isn't functioning, usually there are sound issues that happen, you know, and, and for us in singing, breathing, singing is truly controlled exhalation. When singers breathe in, the inhalation is usually shorter than the exhalation. And so really what we're trying to do is get the most efficient relaxed exhalation so that the sound can just soar through the air. And there's, it, it sounds easier than it actually is when we're trying to figure out, you know, how to get everybody to make it work for themselves. Um, when we breathe in everyday life, and you'll know this because you're a respiratory therapist, you know, it's pretty shallow. Your body is used to being efficient, so it takes in just enough air to breathe and get through the day. But if we're singing long phrases, and shallow is a great example, you know, <laughs> like those big high notes that are a little bit longer, that requires controlled or managed exhalation. And so, you know, that's when we're trying to help singers um, take in enough air to to manage that but also release the air in a in a metered fashion so that that sound stays consistent and also everything feels relaxed in singing it's really if if i simplify it it's kind of two things there's muscle action and breath energy and those two things have to balance out if there's excess muscle action happening usually we get tension in the throat okay. right there's like a tightness happening and if there is excess breath Sometimes we get a breathy sound or it's there's not enough tone happening and we can't get any power. So those two pieces kind of have to work together in order for us to get big, relaxed sound to come out. Does that, does that make sense? That makes complete sense. And actually, ironically, I have heard this about doing different accents. In oh, okay. The Irish, the Irish accent is very kind of melodic, right? And everybody tends to go really high with their Irish accent, like, boop dee doo dee doo but I've always heard if you want to do a good one, you really have to open the throat and let the sound flow so that it's very, it's much more melodic. 
That makes a lot of sense. And you know, using words like flow um, makes a lot of sense in relation to breath. Sometimes in singing, we've used in the past, pedagogy has changed a lot in, in singing. And I would say when I was growing, out, growing up, we always used to refer to breath as breath support. And we're getting away from using the term support because it's kind of sounds like a rigid word. Like when we're, when I say the word support, it sounds like I'm holding something up or grabbing it. And really breath, we want to be flexible, right? Or buoyant and have movement. Even when you're singing and, and controlling that exhalation and you're resisting the urge for your lungs to cave in, which is what we're doing when we're controlling that exhalation, we want the air to flow. Everything needs to be supple and flexible and buoyant. And so I'm starting to use words like breath energy versus breath support so that the words that I'm using match the action that I'm expecting, which is flexibility. Flexibility, which is beautiful because I'm always talking to you on the mat of like letting things flow and especially using your breath to, to help carve out those little spaces that you can and the physical movement. And I often say, you know, true on the mat, true off the mat. And I think that's true with singing. Like if if you're able to create that flow and have it be um, buoyant and vibrant and, and so on, like true in singing, true in life, like I kind of feel like those go together. Um, tell me maybe about the mechanics of breathing. So how do you manipulate? What's kind of your first go-to for starting to get that breath, uh, breath energy or vocal control? Well, you know, for me, it has a lot to do with explaining to people that we often use the term or have heard the term sing from the diaphragm, and it's not necessarily from the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is moving. Um, it hangs, I'm sure you know this, hangs in the body like in a double dome shape. And when you take air into your lungs, it flattens out, right? And so, and we can't consciously control it. So we can't sing from the diaphragm, but the diaphragm is engaged. And so I'm often talk to people about finding where the diaphragm is in the body. And I'm going to back up just a little bit. But usually I ask people to put their hands in kind of L's on the side of their body and look for their lowest rib. So okay. I, I find the lowest rib because the diaphragm is the floor of the rib cage. And then I ask people to feel around the front and look for that, like that piece underneath the rib cage, if they can feel it. So either you're looking at the side of your body, looking for that lowest rib, or you're finding kind of the, where you can curl your hands underneath your ribs at the front. And what you want to do when you're singing is you want to feel an expansion three, you know, all the way around your body, 360, um, low down, I kind of imagine it like having a rubber band around your torso, right at the lowest rib level or a tire. Yeah. And we can liken it to a car, right? To sing well, you need gas in the car and the gas has to come from this area or you're going to be sputtering on the highway. You want to sing high notes. You want to sing really well. You really need your gas in the car to function in an efficient manner. So you're looking, and I often have one hand up high here on the chest because you want your chest to sit comfortably high. And then the other hand on the belly button area. And I ask people to breathe in and keep their shoulders low. And people and can try this as you're talking, yes? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you can't really see my lowest hand, but I want the lower hand to move and not the upper hand. So often when people come to me for singing lessons, they breathe in and go like this and their shoulders lift and this area lifts up and what, and that is a, a shallow breath. So what I'm looking for is a breath that engages this area. So thinking about that 360 degrees all the way around the body. And if I'm, if I do, I, sometimes with kids, I do superhero pose. So like fists, like superwoman. And I breathe in and I want my fist to feel the expansion of the lung on the sides of my body. So I breathe in and keep my shoulders low. And I often breathe in through the nose first so that people can really feel that go in. And then we exhale. And then and when we do exercises, often we start with a hissing sound. Okay. So a s sound. And I would maybe pull up Google metronome, set it to 100. And if you just type metronome into Google and metronome is a thing that keeps you know, a certain beat, so 100 beats per minute. And I often ask people to breathe in for four counts and what, inhale for four counts and then release on a hiss for eight. So okay. for example, if, I, if this was the beat, I would go. And then I get rid of all the rest of the air. And then I would breathe in again for four counts and go to 12. Then breathe in again for four counts and go to 16. 
and I might try that in reps. It's just like lifting weights. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing uh, controlled exhalation using a hiss. And then we graduate to doing, to using pitches and, and pitches meaning notes. Yeah. And then the next level of that would be to do something called SOVT exercises, which are semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that before. It sounds advanced. <laughs> it's not, it's not. Um, I, an example of a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise is like a hum or a lip trill. So a lip trill is like this. Okay. So, so that means that your mouth is partially closed and some of the energy that's coming uh, up through your mouth is going back behind your, your vocal folds and helping them to flutter with um, less pressure. So if I'm fluttering here and my vocal folds are vibrating, it's splitting the pressure. So there's less pressure happening here. Okay. So yeah. out, of, out of curiosity, how long can you hold your exhale? Like you well, this, how many I'm actually, I would say I could probably go to 30 seconds. If I tried, I'd probably go a little longer, but it's not something where I wouldn't say that I measure it in how long, how long a, a singer can hold their breath is a measurement of how good of a singer they are. It, it, that's not really, yeah. I, I wouldn't call that a real measurement in singing. For, for me, I would say if I'm teaching someone who's little, which means under the age of 10, I'm looking for them to get to 12, 12 or 16 counts would be really, really good. Okay. And if I'm teaching a teenager or, an, or a beginner adult, I'm looking for somewhere between 16 and 24 counts okay. because most phrases aren't going to be longer than that. So I, I'm 16 to 24 counts then is yeah. that what you're saying? Okay, something yeah. to <laughs> and, it, and it really is about keeping the airflow steady and, and feeling relaxed in here. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard but this, but singers often use straws um, a, as a tool for practicing breath. So I keep them, I keep like a little bouquet at my desk <laughs> and truly like I would breathe in for four and maybe sing out a note and go, and then breathe in again. So this tool helps to semi-occlude my vocal tract and releases the air down a very small funnel. And I just make sure not to um, apply too much pressure, but that is that is helping me sort of um, manage my breath and uh, release with a clean sound. So it's kind of a full control from the diaphragm to the vocal cords to the lips. Kind yeah, of. you want to think of like, when I breathe in, I think about a jug of juice. When you pour juice into a jug, it fills from the bottom up. Yes. So you want to go all the way down. And, and in singing, I kind of think of it as using maybe 80% of your capacity, like filling up. You don't want to fill up so much that you feel tight. Yes. You, you, want, to, you want to expand to a comfortable level, and then you're going to manage the exhalation. I hope people are taking notes because I <laughs> talk about this all the time. I'm like, <laughs> on the mat, if you are holding a pose, like if you're so far into it that you're holding your breath, you're not doing yourself any favors. It all comes back to that flexibility piece, right? Like we want to feel supple and buoyant and flexible. So if we're grabbing, and that often happens with singers and, and ab muscles, the ab muscles actually aren't engaged too much on the inhalation. They're more, more engaged on the exhalation for helping us release in a metered fashion. But we want that relaxation in the torso. You know, when you take the air in, you want you want to totally release those muscles. And I, I teach a lot of dancers who are learning to sing and they have different things to learn because they're taught in, in, in dance to suck in and pull up a lot. Yeah. And so trying to get them to release the muscles so that they have feel a, a lot of relaxation and the lungs can just hang yeah. um, it is a different feeling for them. And it takes a while to adjust to that. And it would be a balance, if, especially if they are dancing while they're singing, like that movement, you're asking a lot of your body. Absolutely. Moments. So that's... And, and, and honestly, you know, I still learn things about breath management all the time. I, I follow a singing teacher named Andrew Byrne, who's incredible. Uh, I, I follow a lot of the Berkeley Music School accounts. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've learned a lot, but I have a lot left to learn. There's, there's, there's new pedagogical stuff happening all the time. Well, and that's the crazy thing, like even, and I, I explain this to people too, being a respiratory therapist, people are like, oh, like it's breathing, like everybody breathes, we've got this figured out. And I'm like, we are so far from actually having a full understanding of the impact of the breath and how it works. Like we've traced the neurofeedback, but to actually sync that and mimic that 
either in machines or, you know, when something's not going right, it's not easy. It's not, it's more of an art form than a science, I think. Well, and, and breathing has been connected to health in so many ways, right? Like we now, we really have to remember that having, taking in deep breaths actually helps to do all sorts of things that are positive in our body, like lower blood pr pressure or, you know, oxygenate the blood. Like there's lots of benefits to, to being conscious of, of how you're breathing and, and getting those low, deep breaths that feel, um, feel calming to your whole body. Exactly right. Cause the vagus nerve runs right through that diaphragm and that's going to give you feedback. If you're breathing well, mm -hmm. say, Hey, you're calm, you're safe. You can relax. So it's kind Absolutely. of like cyclical feedback. When did you learn? Like, I don't know when you started singing, but when did you kind of learn like the breath is really the foundational like starting point? Was there like a moment where it clicked for you? Uh, you know what? My journey with breath is actually pretty interesting. I took lessons in singing classical music starting at age 16. And I did learn about breathing. And I had about six voice teachers over the course of my time from age 16 to maybe 26. So that 10 year period, just going to different schools and things. And I, I don't know that I fully figured out how to get a consistently low breath that felt automatic to me until I was closer to the end of that cycle. And I say that because I could get a lot of sound with very minimal breath. And so, you know, if you're, if you can belt and b make big sound and not need, you know, a deep breath, you're, you're less inclined to want to put the work in, but I do wish I'd put the work in earlier because what happened to me is that eventually my range was limited. You know, oh. at some point my breath was not working efficiently. And so I had a, I had excessive muscular tension happening in my throat. So when I was trying to belt up high, I would literally hit what felt like a ceiling. It was like, oh, and I couldn't get any further. And it wasn't until I worked with Stephanie Kramer, who's a voice teacher at the University of Waterloo, um, who called me out on this and, and could knew right away that I wasn't breathing as efficiently as I could. It was because of her that I basically had to go back to basics and relearn how to engage in the most efficient way possible. And she changed my voice in a very key way um, because being able to access that breath capacity uh, consistently allowed me to do all sorts of things with my voice that I wasn't able to do before. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's been on her part and for you, right? That really changes your your range and your perspective. And well, you're just your ability. And and I think I wasn't ready maybe to listen to other teachers. I'm sure they tried. Uh, <laughs> but because I could get certain sound, I was like, man, okay, whatever. Uh, but it, it was only until I hit a roadblock that I was like, oh, I got to change something. And I was lucky that I had someone in my life at the time who was capable of, of helping me relearn yeah. Uh, how to do that. And I think that's a big thing too, right? Finding the right teacher at the right time. Like life kind of does that cycle thing where it'll bring you back to something just in case you didn't quite get it the first time to, to help you grow, right? And to help you. Mm -hmm. expand. So <laughs> you, you mentioned this, but what kind of, like you mentioned the impacts on health, but away from singing, what impacts do you find breathing has on your life? Uh, well, I use deep breathing for all sorts of things outside of singing. I mean, when I'm feeling stressed, I, I, I'm a fan of meditation and that's pretty new for me. Uh, that's probably a two year, I'm about two years into that using meditation and deep breathing is a key part of that for me. I, I live a pretty busy life with, uh, you know, comparatively quite a bit of stress. And so I needed to find ways to quiet my mind and to calm my body. And I find you know, breathing exercises to really help with that. Nice. That's, and the thing that I love about this, and even when you're talking about, you know, taking that breath in and, and doing the hissing sounds, you can do that in your car while you're driving. Like this, is I do lip trills all the time. You would not believe like partially because it's so good for your voice, but truly like something can come on the radio. Like let's say it's living on a prayer and I'm like, literally, <laughs> Truly, just because that flexibility helps me for other things, or I might just like be doing deep breaths in the car and releasing on like, a, like a ha ha sound to, to feel really connected down low. So I might do ha ha ha, and it sounds ridiculous, 
but it helps me feel relaxed. I want to go on a road trip with you. So. Oh yeah, all the sounds, all of the sounds. <laughs> all the sounds, all the time. We're totally going to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing I'll say, and before we hit record on this, you and I were talking about age, but I do find people who are vocalists and people who play wind instruments, their faces are so toned, they always look so, so young. So I'm just saying, everyone, there are huge benefits. I'm not sure those two things are connected, yeah. but I'll take the compliment Don't for sure. For me, I'm so convinced they are because, like, especially if you're playing a wind instrument, like your cheeks are so well toned, right? Your entire face, your jaw, your you're definitely using specific muscles. Yeah, I'm just saying. There's a, I think there's a strong, strong correlation. Mm. Uh, what would be one piece of advice that you would give people to just improve their breathing? Something simple that they can do anywhere, anytime, maybe. Uh, I think releasing to, to counts helps like releasing on an, either an ooh sound or a hiss. And also understanding that your mind doesn't need to be blank. One of the biggest hurdles I had while learning deep breathing was that my mind would be racing with all sorts of things. And I think we, we, we tend to believe that your mind should be completely free of distraction while you're breathing, but that's not entirely true. Part of breathing is just the act of doing the breathing itself. And if your mind wants to race off in a hundred places, great. You yeah. know, in my case, it's literally just making time, you know, to, to breathe in and out and be conscious of what's happening in your body, like doing a body scan. So breathing in and out, let's say in inhaling for four counts and then releasing for you know, eight, 12, 16, whatever, I close my eyes and I try to imagine what's happening in my body and be conscious of what, how I feel my lungs are expanding and what's happening internally. The more awareness we have to those muscle actions, the easier it is for us to make changes to them or, or to c connect to them quickly the next time. And to notice how you're growing. I mm. would say too, right? Because I, I would say awareness is just a muscle that you're flexing as well. 100%. Whether it's for the breath or for how you're walking or for how you're standing or anything, right? Mm. It's, it's muscle. But I love that you hit on that because I've had people tell me they can't do yoga because they can't quiet their mind. And I'm like, that's not, that'll come. It's not essential. Yeah, it will come. I also think it's important for people to understand that there's no one specific sensation that you need to feel. I think, you know, in, in teaching voice, we, we understand as teachers that everybody's body is different. So if I feel resonation or vibration up here in my nose and cheek area, that may not necessarily be true for my student. Our thumbprints are unique. Our voices are unique. Every muscle is built differently because we have this specific unique DNA. And so just because I feel something specifically doesn't mean that the student will. So part of my job is to help them scan their body and tell me what they're feeling and if it feels good or not good. Yes. <laughs> right? And so as long as we're getting the sound that we desire and it feels relaxed and healthy, if, if the sensation for them is in a completely different part of their face or, or body than mine, that's completely fine. I think that is so beautiful, letting go of this concept of what is right. Like what is, it doesn't always have to be like that. We're all different. So we're going to feel it differently, mm -hmm. experience it differently. Like in even looking at, you know, I, I grew up with two siblings. The three of us are very different. We had very, like we had the same upbringing, but we all experienced it differently. Well, and that's, that's just true for everything related to what you do with your body. And because your body is your instrument when you're singing, you're, you're just going to experience exercises, songs, everything differently than someone else. And that's why I say to, to students, especially younger students, mimicking is a great way to learn how to do specific things specific things if you want to, but truly you're trying to discover your own unique voice and put your own stamp onto songs and do your own version of it. That is so beautiful. That is, that is the most profound thing. Mm. Like, I'm so glad, so glad that you're sharing this because it's so many beautiful messages wrapped up in what you do and you convey it so well. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks. So Amanda, like I've said, is an amazing singer. Right now you have, you spent COVID writing and releasing some music. So there is a pop song out called Easier, which is on my playlist and I love it. Oh, thanks. There's, a, oh. it's like if it was a cassette, it would probably be busted by now. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Like I said, I love your voice. Like when people ask, oh, what kind of singers do you like? I'm like, 
you don't know her yet, but her name's Amanda. You'll Aww. Uh, there's also a country song out called We're Okay, so I've got to get that in the mix. But these songs, Easier and We're Okay, are available on every streaming platform out there. Mm -hmm. So you can search Amanda Kind. And there'll be a link in the bio and everywhere that this is posted. You can follow her at Amanda Kind. Is that Instagram? On Instagram, it's Miss A Kind. I've had that forever. I don't know why, but that, that's my handle on, on Twitter and on Instagram. <laughs> Love it. So people can find you and you do voice stuff. So if anyone's looking for improvements or they want to learn to sing, you're never too old. There's no such thing. Uh, you're never too old for sure. For sure. And I will wholeheartedly, you have done Glee for the last all of its years here in KW region. Yeah, Steve Lehman and I started KW Glee together in 2010. And we've been on hiatus since the beginning of the pandemic, but we are definitely hoping to be back. And that was a, it's, it continues to be a beautiful journey for us developing young talent. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to being back in a rehearsal room with kids singing. I, you know, it's, I, I'm sure I will sob uncontrollably. I'm so excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The last time you came out and you were chatting at the last Glee show I was at and you were, it, I think it was like the 10 years. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You were like, there's no way I'm getting through this without sobbing. And just immediately I was like, oh girl, I want to give you a huge hug. Yeah. I'm so lucky. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible because for people who don't know, just finding your voice, whether you want to be a singer, whether you just want to sound okay in the car or the shower or for your own benefit like it goes beyond actually just singing it's really flexing your muscles of confidence you know you're drawing up power from within you every time you use your voice and every time you sing so oh i love that drawing up power from within you that's so true it's so so true so it's a beautiful thing and the best part is is you can do it and share it with the world or you could do it and just have it be for you. So yeah, that's why we do. I, I mean, I do a variation of things. I have private lessons that I do, but I also do something called karaoke confidence, which is a class that like maybe six adults sign up for and people usually it's people who've never sung in front of other people before. And we talk all about vocal health and technique and everybody sings in front of each other. And it's a small cohort in on a zoom room. And so, you know, I, I've, I haven't done it in a while, but when those come up, they, they are usually super popular for exactly this reason. People need to build their confidence. They want to do it in a controlled setting. And it's a chance for people to like belt it out in front of other people and get get some get some of those nerves out of their body and it's always super um moving to watch yeah i bet you it's incredibly liberating for people to mm -hmm. take that step forward so basically what we're saying is check out amanda keep <laughs> it for karaoke confidence and yeah practice some of these things grab a straw practice your hissing yeah, I'll give you the videos. There's a there's a great video about the guy who invented the straw exercise, and I, there's some good hissing videos. I can give them all to you. All right, we will link those below. Thank you so much for your time, Amanda. It means the world to us, and so, so grateful to have you on today. Thank you so much. It's been great to chat.